Last week, I was listening to a business guru explain how it was possible to multiply time. Time, the most valuable asset, the thing you can never get back once you've lost it, and the one thing that most people say stands in their way to creating healthy, from scratch meals the most. I loved this man's take on how a person can multiply their time. You can read it as it applies to business in his book, Procrastinate on Purpose, but basically the five methods he teaches are eliminate, automate, delegate, consolidate, and procrastinate. Over the past 10-ish years of juggling homesteading with motherhood, along with running a business, I have found myself using these same strategies, and today I want to walk you through my kitchen power hour method and how it uses several of these concepts to create more time in my day so that I can cook more from scratch meals and ultimately have more of that precious commodity time. I'm also going to show you some of our favorite from scratch recipes that are quick and easy yet nourishing. If you're new here, I'm Stacy, homeschooling and homesteading mama of seven on a mission to ditch the grocery store and become more self-sufficient. Subscribe to our channel to learn more about our journey and how we were making that dream come true. So you may be thinking, okay, I get that you can prep meals ahead or batch cook, but what do you mean by multiply time? Here are some examples. When you take meat out to defrost, it takes a shorter amount of time to cook. You didn't just transfer where you spent the time, you eliminated it. This saves time, and over the long haul, that really adds up. Now, let's look at an example of using a meal planning and prepping system. Setting up a meal planning system and organizing all of your recipes will take you some time to get set up at first, but by doing it, you will significantly decrease the amount of time you spend in the future. While this isn't totally an automated system, it's close and that it no longer needs brain power to make it all work. You just follow the plan. And in fact, the longer you utilize the system you set up, the shorter amount of time meal prep takes. Batch cooking breakfast for a month is one way that I have dramatically reduced the amount of time I spend in the kitchen prepping meals. This would fall under the consolidate step of the strategy. Now, I'll be honest and say that I don't always make the time to do this, but I always regret it when I don't. I have a video showing how I do this, so I'll link it below, but when it comes to how it saves time, just think about this. Let's say it would take 45 minutes to make a from scratch meal in the morning. They're about 30 days in a month, so we'll say that's about 22 and a half hours of meal prep. When I batch cook breakfast for the month, it only takes me six to eight hours, depending on what I make. That's 14 less hours, making it so much more doable to get from scratch breakfasts on the table. While many people think that meal planning sounds restrictive, I've found that the time savings and the stress relief that comes with it allows me to actually have fun with trying new things. On this particular Sunday night, I decided to make up some pumpkin spice overnight oats. I had other things prepped and ready to go if needed, but doing so gave me the opportunity to feel inspired to try something fun. To make this recipe, you just add 16 ounces pumpkin puree, three and three quarters cups of old fashioned rolled oats, three cups plain or vanilla flavored yogurt, one cup of milk, half cup maple syrup, two teaspoons vanilla extract, five teaspoons pumpkin pie spice, and a pinch of salt to a large bowl. Stir to combine well, then I just separated the mixture into eight ounce jelly jars so that they would be handy for the kids to grab the next morning. These should be refrigerated for at least four hours before serving. Now let's talk more about my kitchen power hour, which is literally just spending one hour a day doing all the day's meal prep. This is the main way that I multiply my time and I'd say falls under the consolidate step of this multiplying time strategy. The meals have been pre-planned, which saves a ton of time and mental space. To plan the meals, I came up with 28 meals for the season. So for example, we eat 28 different meals in September and then repeat those same meals in October and November. The extra days that are obviously in a month allow for where we would end up at a friend's or eating out. Also, sometimes I follow the order of the meals that's on the sheet, and other times I just pick whatever sounds good or what aligns with what I grabbed from the garden that day. I try to keep all the ingredients for all the meals on hand so I can just choose last minute if need be. And then putting the ingredients needed in these bins two weeks at a time 
really helps as well. I know not everyone has the space. In the past, when I had less space, I used gallon Ziploc bags to kind of do the same thing. But either way, having your meals prepped ahead of time and knowing what you're gonna make is going to save so much time and so much mental space. On this day's kitchen power hour, I'm starting by getting dinner going, which is chicken tortilla soup. This is such a simple and satisfying meal, and it's also something I really like to make for company too, because it's easy to double or triple the amount, and it always turns out amazing. You simply add three boneless, skinless chicken breasts, frozen is fine, a quart of chicken broth, a cup of water, 15 ounces of canned black beans, 14 ounces of corn, you can use canned or frozen, and then the heat of that salsa will determine the heat of your soup. One medium onion diced, one teaspoon garlic powder, one teaspoon chili powder, one teaspoon cumin, and a half teaspoon of paprika. Add it all to a slow cooker, give it a little stir, and then cook on low for five to six hours. Another thing I wanna mention is that while ideally this hour occurs in the morning before I start my day, it's pretty flexible. This means that if you're in a busy time of life with littles and can't get to it at 6 a.m., that's fine. Just get it done sometime in the morning, whenever you have the time. I know before I had big kids to help with babies, morning nap was a good time to do this. If you're doing a slow cooker meal, obviously you have to allow enough time for the cooking to happen, but even then you can usually switch from doing a slow cooker recipe for a long time on low to speeding it up on high for half the time. And by the way, I'm a huge fan of using a slow cooker because it's basically like delegating the cooking to an appliance. After dinner is prepped, I make lunch. I usually do it in this order just in case something happens and I run out of time. Having dinner going is way more important because lunch is something I can whip together more easily if needed. I have a schedule of what I make for lunch on each day, but this can vary a bit depending on how much time or energy I have. Today, I'm making sourdough crackers, sliced cheese, boiled eggs, and serving those alongside some yogurt and berries. These sourdough crackers are a staple in our house and they are so easy to make. There is no ferment time needed and your starter really doesn't even have to be active either, so they're easy enough to make on a whim. In fact, on this day, I didn't even have enough starter, so I just added flour and water until I had the right amount and they still came out wonderfully. They don't stay fresh tasting for very long, so if I make them a day or two ahead of time, I like to warm them up before serving, although we usually can't help ourselves and we eat them very quickly. To make them, you just mix together in a medium bowl, a cup of flour, a cup of sourdough starter, a teaspoon of brown or maple sugar, half teaspoon baking soda, quarter teaspoon salt, quarter cup olive oil or avocado oil, you can also add in whatever seasonings or ingredients you want to flavor them. Preheat a baking stone or a baking sheet in a 350 degree oven while you roll out the dough. Divide the dough into four balls and then roll out on parchment paper to about 1 16th of an inch thick if you want them thin and crisp or a quarter inch if you want them more bread-like and puffy. I then use a pizza cutter to cut a grid pattern for the crackers and sprinkle them with coarse salt. After the oven is preheated, each one gets popped into the oven until they start to brown, which should be about 12 minutes. Finally, cool them on a rack and your crackers are ready to go. I just store these in a Tupperware container until lunchtime. It is so nice come evening when dinner is made and ready to go. To serve the chicken tortilla soup, you just need to shred the chicken and give it a stir. Then we like to serve it with cheese, sour cream, and Fritos, which I realize are not from scratch, but we like them so much with this meal that we stock up and keep them in our cellar just for this meal. The next day's meal was one that was so easy to throw together. I'm making baked salmon and homemade wild rice aroni. Really, the only thing that needs to be done in the morning is to make the topping for the salmon, and this could be done at the last minute too, but I found that the longer it marinates in the topping, the better it tastes. I don't measure the ingredients for this because it depends on how much salmon I'm making, but I just mix mayonnaise, dried dill, paprika, and salt and pepper, or whatever seasonings that sound good that day, and a splash of lemon juice. I then put a pretty thick layer of this across all of the fillets. Then I sprinkle that with some breadcrumbs and it's ready to go. I'll cover this and put it in the fridge until I'm ready to bake it. To bake it, you should cook it at 375 degrees until it is cooked through, which takes about the same amount of time as it does for me to make the rice aroni if I have all of my ingredients prepared. 
This riceroni is liked by even my pickiest eaters and it is so simple. In fact, some days I just make this riceroni and add some canned chicken and it is a very quick and easy meal. I'm using wild rice we harvested locally here, but you can substitute any long grain rice. Start by melting three tablespoons of butter in a large pan, then add three quarters cup of broken vermicelli pieces and a half cup of rice. Stir until the noodle pieces start to turn golden brown. And if you have a large family like we do, you'll probably want to double this recipe as well. These vermicelli noodles were made using our pasta maker, dried and then broken into pieces, but you can use store-bought and do the same thing. I actually made these noodles almost a year ago and they're still fine and we're still using this massive jar up. So once you go through the process of making them, if you choose to do so, it really saves a lot of time in the future. As soon as the noodles start to brown, add in a quart of chicken broth, half teaspoon Italian seasoning, quarter teaspoon garlic powder, a teaspoon of parsley, and salt to taste. Bring to a boil and then reduce the heat to a simmer and add the lid. Let simmer covered until all of the liquid is absorbed and the rice is cooked, which takes about 20 minutes. Fluff with a fork and it's ready to serve alongside your salmon. On my meal plan, I like to have a mix of slow cooker recipes, easy prep meals, and also a few that can be made at the last minute because while not ideal, it still happens. The next day was a good example of that. I didn't have time to do my kitchen power hour in the morning, so for lunch we had leftovers, and then for dinner I made scalloped potatoes and bacon. This instant pot scalloped potatoes and bacon dish ends up looking pretty impressive, but it is so simple to throw together, especially if you have any leftover ham or bacon ready to go. I didn't, so I just put some bacon in the oven at 350 while I got my potatoes prepped and cooked. Then I just peel and slice about four pounds of yellow potatoes in half inch thick slices. Place the potatoes and three cups of vegetable broth in an instant pot and cook for one minute on high pressure. Then do a quick release, which just means to manually let the pressure out of the instant pot by turning the knob. Next, preheat your oven to broil and transfer the potatoes to a nine by 13 pan, leaving the broth in the instant pot. Add in the cubed ham or the crumbled bacon with the potatoes gently and set that aside. Next to that instant pot that still has the broth in it, add 12 ounces of cheese, one teaspoon salt, half teaspoon pepper, a teaspoon of garlic powder, a teaspoon of dried thyme, and then mix that together. Then you're going to turn the instant pot on saute and stir it until it is smooth. Then pour that cheese sauce over the potatoes and bacon and toss to distribute. Top with a little bit more cheese and finally broil for four to six minutes until bubbly and brown. Don't look away and let it burn. Trust me, I have done this. On days like this where I throw together a quick meal, it is so nice to have things like canned fruit, sauerkraut, and pickled veggies on the shelves and ready to serve as a side. The next kitchen hour prep I'm going to share with you is chicken pot pie. And as I was putting this video together, I realized I'm showing a lot of chicken recipes. So know that we didn't actually eat these meals in this order. And I do actually try to vary our proteins from day to day. Chicken pot pie is so great to make ahead and can even be frozen so that you can eat it another day or bring it to a friend and they can bake it whenever they're in need of a meal. I also like using canned chicken in this recipe because it saves a lot of time. Canned meat is another one of those convenience foods that I love to keep on my shelves. To make the chicken pot pie, start by buttering a 9 by 13 pan and setting it aside. Now, if you have a much smaller family than we do, you can cut this recipe in half and just put it in a pie pan. Then we're gonna start making the crust. In a food processor or mixer, pulse or blend five cups of flour, half teaspoon salt, and one tablespoon sugar until well blended. Add a cup of butter, diced, and one cup of lard or shortening. Pulse or blend until it gets to a pea size consistency. Then slowly add six to 12 tablespoons of water, pulsing as you go until the dough holds together well. Separate the dough into two even balls. Wrap the dough balls in plastic wrap and refrigerate while you prep the other ingredients. Then peel and dice two cups of carrots, slice and chop about two thirds cup of celery or use frozen pre-sliced. Peel and dice one onion and wash and dice seven to eight medium yellow potatoes. Next, saute the diced onion in four tablespoons of butter over medium heat until they're translucent. 
Add in a quart of canned chicken, not the juices, just the chicken, shredding and mixing in with the onion until well combined. With a slotted spoon, remove the onion and chicken to a plate and set them aside. Add in the carrots, celery, and potatoes and saute until slightly softened. Then stir in the peas and broth and cover and let it simmer for five minutes. While it's simmering, mix one cup of flour, two teaspoons salt, a teaspoon of pepper, and two cups of milk in a bowl until smooth. Add this mixture to the veggies and stir just until thickened. Then stir in the chicken and onion and remove it from the heat. It's time to roll out the pie dough. So remove those dough balls from the fridge and roll out one ball between two pieces of plastic wrap into a large rectangle or a circle if you're using a pie pan, slightly larger than your pan. Remove the top layer of plastic and use the bottom layer to position the bottom crust onto the bottom of the pan. Press gently into the pan and let the sides hang over the edge. Roll out the second ball of dough in the same way. Mine was being very difficult to roll out, but I think it was due to my butter. For whatever reason, if I use our homemade butter after it's been frozen, it tends to be more on the crumbly side. Pour the pie mixture into the pan and then cover the top with the second rectangle of dough. Trim the edges of the dough and press the top and bottom together and make a few slices across the top of the dough to allow steam to vent. Then cover with plastic wrap or foil and refrigerate until it's time to bake. For lunch this day, I made tuna wraps and cream cheese dip to serve with sliced apples. The cream cheese dip was very easy, just eight ounces of softened cream cheese, a cup of vanilla yogurt, and a half cup of maple syrup. Then I also served pickles along with it. While we eat our lunch, we like to watch World Watch News as part of our homeschool day. World Watch delivers the most important news alongside some short history or science lessons, and it does it all in a way that aligns with our values and doesn't use news to provoke fear. It's been a really good solution to both staying in the loop and not getting sucked into unnecessary news. It's actually also the only way I get my news now as well. I'll put a link in the description if you want to check it out. Okay, to finish the pot pie an hour before you're ready to serve dinner, simply preheat the oven to 400 degrees Fahrenheit and remove the chicken pot pie from the refrigerator. After the oven comes to temperature, remove the plastic wrap or foil and bake uncovered for 35 to 40 minutes or until it begins to bubble out of the slits and the crust is golden brown. Serve hot and enjoy. I have one last power hour to share with you and it's another favorite way to use chicken. It also utilizes the slow cooker and it's pretty versatile in how you serve it. To make this creamy sun-dried tomato chicken, you'll need eight to 10 chicken thighs, bone in or boneless and the skin removed. Start by combining a quarter cup of cornstarch a tablespoon of salt, and one teaspoon of pepper. Thinly slice one large onion and mince two cloves of garlic. Pat the chicken thighs dry with a paper towel and then toss them in the cornstarch mixture until they're fully coated. Heat two tablespoons of olive oil in a large oven-proof frying pan or Dutch oven. Add the chicken four pieces at a time and brown on each side. As the chicken is browned, remove it and set it into your slow cooker. Add one tablespoon of oil to the pan and heat to medium-high. Then add the sliced onion and saute for two minutes. Next, add in the one cup of sun-dried tomatoes, the garlic, a teaspoon of Italian seasoning, and a pinch of red pepper flakes. Saute this all together for another 30 seconds. Then add in a can of coconut milk and a cup of chicken broth and bring it to a boil. Remove the sauce and veggies from the heat and pour it over the chicken in the slow cooker. Then set the heat setting to low and cook for five to six hours. We like to eat this over roasted cauliflower, but it's also really great with basmati rice or your starch of choice. Well, I hope you found this video helpful. Meal prepping is such a time saver and a stress reducer in my life when I'm good about doing it. And I know that this kitchen power hour system could help you take back your time while making from scratch meals as well.